morning we are going to be speaking uh, from the word. I'm going to be speaking from the word from Hebrews chapter 11. And if you haven't been with us, I'm going to give you a quick update as to where we are in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the Great Hall of Faith. Uh, if you didn't know that before, and it takes you through a list of people who are renowned for their amazing faith. God accredited them with all kinds of acclamation for their wonderful faith. And um, as we're looking at this, we're calling this series Faith That Moves. And this is not a blind faith. It's not a type of blind faith at all. It's a tangible faith. In the first week, we looked at creation and how creation, the creation that is all around us, points to a creator. And because of that creator and because of the creation around us that points to him, we recognize that the faith that we have isn't actually just this blind faith, but rather a tangible faith. He made something out of nothing. We said, like, if he can make something out of nothing, then he can certainly make something out of us. Then we talked about sacrificial and submissive faith when we looked at the two stories about Abel and Abraham. Abel, when he gave a good sacrifice, better than his brother Cain, and God uh, accredited that to him because he had faith. And then Abraham, when he was called to sacrifice his one and only son, he, he went almost to the very edge of it with the knife in the air, ready to plunge it down, and God stopped him and recognized that he was ready to sacrifice it all. Sacrifice it all because he believed that God was really God. And so he submitted to that authority. They both recognized they had two choices, one choice to submit and the other to not, and they both chose to submit. Then last week, we went on with Abraham a little further and we talked about his obedient faith, faith that obeyed the call of God. And we, uh, had a little memory, walk down memory lane when we looked at Batman and we saw that Batman, when he had that little, you know, bat signal up in the clouds, would run to the bat phone and find out what the call was all about. And then he'd be quick to jump to the bat poles and, and obey whatever needed to be done and do the job. So we talked about Abraham kind of in that same way and that he obeyed the call. He didn't even know where he was going, but God blessed him for that. Well, today we're going to talk about a man by the name of Enoch, and we're going to talk about a relational faith, a relational faith. So let's pray as we get into this today and just uh, ask God to, to guide us as we hear from him in his word. Father, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for giving it to us, that we can read it, that we can understand it through your Holy Spirit, that you give us wisdom to understand it. Father, I just pray right now that you would just be at work in our own hearts as we read it, that you'd be active in our hearts and that we would see if there's changes to be made, things that you need to do in us to make us more like you, to reflect you. We want to glorify you. So help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today there's something that I want you to think about. Uh, before we get into Enoch, I want you to think about walking. When you are walking... Each of us actually has a very unique walk. So much so that even the uh, CIA and FBI, when they're, when they're trying to identify people, they can use fingerprints, right? They can use eye, the, the retinal recognition. They can, they can see everybody's unique in these ways. But a person's walk is also very unique. Sometimes you can see somebody from a distance and you'll know just who that person is just by their walk. Maybe you don't see their face yet, but you recognize their walk. Well, here's, a, here's an example. Maybe, maybe you can identify uh, this, this walk. I've got a couple of figures from history and literature. See if you can pick out who they might be. There you go, Napoleon, right, good. I don't know if I do a very good job of imitating his walk, but anyway, Napoleon, right. So you, you picked that one out. How, how about this one? I heard two, and actually, and, 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 I, and I was expecting this. Quasimodo, or Igor, uh, Quasimodo from Hunchback of Notre Dame or Igor uh, from, from Frankenstein, right? So you guys kind of got that down. See, these are walks that are identifiable, identifiable. They're walks that people recognize as something that they've seen before. Well, today we're going to be talking about Enoch's walk. 
his very identifiable walk with God. And so let's look in the Bible now at Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to start in the verses chapter uh, 11, 5 and 6. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 11, verses 5 and 6, here's what it says. And it'll be up on the screen if you didn't bring your Bible with you today. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. That's fascinating. We'll find out more about that in a little bit. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So this all, all this series has been building up, okay? So we had this tangible faith, faith. We could see God's fingerprints on creation. And then it, it was, okay, there's a creator. I need to submit to this creator. That moves us to obey. And now we're looking at more than just a, a, an obedience that's, uh, that, that's just, he told me and I'm going to do it. But this is a, a obedience out of love, out of relationship. And that's what we're looking at today. Enoch walked with God. He walked with God in faith. In fact, it says here, it says here that as he was walking with God, he was just taken away. We don't really know what happened to him. It looks like he didn't actually die. So he was just kind of taken away. There's only one other uh, example of this in scripture. And can anybody name that name? Elijah. Elijah, yes, that's right. Elijah also had the same thing where he was taken up in a chariot of fire. You ever hear that song, Chariots of Fire? Well, there you go. Chariot of Fire, right? And of course, Jesus, right, exactly. Jesus himself. And we'll, we'll talk about that on Easter even more. But here we are looking at Enoch. Now, you may go, who on earth is this guy, Enoch? I, I, maybe some of you never heard of him before. Well, Enoch was the great, 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 great grandson of Adam. Okay? So this is a long time ago. Very, very long ago. So Adam, the first man, this is the great, 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 great grandson. So this is the seventh generation of humans that lived on planet Earth. Only the seventh generation. So uh, that's, that's pretty neat. In fact, Adam, if you look at genealogy, was still alive when Enoch was born. So he would have met him. Um, but this, this man here, Enoch, was before the great flood, okay? He was before the great flood. And he was also very old. How many of you feel old today? I, I'm not saying you are old. How many of you feel old today? I, I did when I was, I was like stiff and stuff. And I thought, oh, yeah, maybe you feel old today. This guy really was old, 365 years old. That's really old. Now, that's not as old as the oldest man. In fact, he's the daddy of the oldest man, whose name is Methuselah, who lived, look at the number, 969 years. That is really old. So this is really something. These guys back then, I mean, when, when the earth was still not as poisoned by uh, the taint of sin and mankind on the earth, on this planet, it was, they were able to live a lot longer and be okay. And so they lived a long time. So if you feel old today, think of Methuselah, okay? He was really old, okay? So, yeah, this guy here, not if you look quite that bad, you know, okay? Maybe you feel that bad, I don't know. But he's smiling, though, that's good. Genesis 5, 21 to 24 tells us more of the story of Enoch. So let's look at that. Genesis 5, so flip back to the beginning. We like to do this because it kind of gives us the backstory on who is being talked about in Hebrews chapter 11. So we're looking at the backstory in Genesis 5, verses 21 to 24. So it says, When Enoch had lived for 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah, which we just heard about. And after he became father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. You know, I was rereading this just even this morning, funny enough. And, I, and when I reread this again this morning, there's something that jumped out that I would not seen. And I want to point it out to you. What were the first words in that verse? Or the first word in that verse? What's the first word? After, right. After he became father of Methuselah. Okay. I don't know what happened in the years prior to becoming father. But sometimes when 
you have a child, you recognize you need to do some, make some changes in your life. And sometimes having kids moves us to the, make those changes. When we recognize, hey, this, this kid that's following after me, he's going to grow up. He's going to be watching me. Okay. So anyway, that's just a little side note. After he became father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years, which we just said. Enoch walked faithfully with God and that he was no more because God took him away. Now, as we read about this man, we don't hear a whole lot of backstory. That's it. That's all we get other than, other than just the, the previous verses that was kind of a geneal, genealogical list that I didn't read. But that's it. That's all we hear about Enoch, really. And then he's commended again in Hebrews 11 for this amazing walk. His walk with God was identifiable. His walk with God was identifiable. And so we want to talk about how we can walk with God more like Enoch did. More like he did. How can we do this? Well, there's some other clues in scripture that talk about what it is to walk with God. And we're going to look at Galatians now. You, if you have your Bibles and you're liking to turn in this way and that way in your Bibles, you're going to be getting to turn a lot. Because we're going to be now in Galatians. Because Galatians speaks to us about when the Apostle Paul wrote to uh, the church in Galatia. He wanted to let them know of what it meant to walk with in the spirit, walk with the spirit of God. And so we get a glimpse into this when we look at Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17. So in the New Testament, Galatians 5, 16 and 17, 16 says this. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So you see this word walk here. We're gonna look at the Greek words for walk in a couple of different contexts. In this context, parapateo, okay, means to walk, to live, to regulate or conduct one's life or oneself. So this is a, a lifestyle. It's, it's getting your life organized, conducting your life, regulating your life in this way. Regulate your life, conduct your life by the Spirit. It says, so I say, walk or regulate your life by the spirit and you will not gratify the, the, the desires of the sinful flesh. Verse 17 says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. So our, we, we tend to have this, this conflict in us because our flesh desires to do one thing and the spirit de desires us to do another thing. But the good news is we have, when we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ for our salvation, the Holy Spirit is in us and he helps us in this walk. So how can we walk with God more like Enoch? Well, the first thing I want you to notice, it's proximity. Okay, walking by the Spirit. That was what we just said. And now in James 4, 8, if you turn over to James 4, 8, or if you may even know this verse, James 4, 8 says, Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay, so this is a proximity thing. So the first thing that we do when we walk with God, the first thing to be more like Enoch in this kind of walk is a proximity. Be close to him. Get close to him. If we want to walk with him, we've got to be close to him. If, we, if we're not walking with him, then we can't see where he's going. We live in a dark and fallen world. The further we get from him, the harder it is to see him. We need to look for him and his light and walk with him. It says here, come near. Come near. And he will come near to you. This, this word... Um, and Gizzo means to get close. It's that whole idea of proximity. To get connected. To draw near. He's reaching out. We need to just accept that hand as he's reaching out and draw near to him. Draw near to him. Let him pull us close to him. 
So the next thing after proximity that we saw there in James 4, 8 is pace. How can we walk more like Enoch did? How can we walk with God this way? It's all about pacing ourselves. And let's look at Galatians 5. It'll be up here on the screen. Galatians 5, 25. It says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now this keep in step idea is walking again. It's walking in step with the Spirit. A lot of you may have trudged out and braved the elements when we had that big snowstorm. And when you did, you probably made some footprints in the snow. And the first time you go out, you kind of gotta lift your feet and you make these big footprints and you're lifting your feet up and get, making, trudging your way out through. And then when you come back, you wanna kind of keep this the same path because it's easier. So you put your feet back in the holes and you go the other way. Well, if you go back out again and you start on the wrong foot, Say the first time you started on your right foot, you made your hole. Then the left foot, you made your hole. What happens if you start out the next time with your left foot? You look over here, and then you crisscross over here, and before you know it, you're face first in the snow. You can't do it very well. So we want to walk in those steps. We want to walk step by step with God. Kind of like that. Now, there's another e example, like we just saw the snow here. Um, there's another example that you may be familiar with in walking in step, and, and that would be the three-legged race. How many of you have ever done a three-legged race? How many of you have ever fell flat on your face in a three-legged race? I know I have. Flat on your face. You go along, and because you, you're trying to keep the step with the person with you, and you're tied to them, and you try to, and you go, and oh, that wasn't right, and flat on your face. And it can happen to anybody when you're doing these silly races. But walking in step, you gotta pace yourself. You gotta pace yourself. Get the pace just right as you're walking. If you, I, I know my kids, when they did field day, they, they love to practice ahead of time. They get together to be, because there's more, there's four of them. So they get to, they tie their legs together. Let's go practice in the backyard. And then they get their steps figured out how they were gonna do it. And it was great. But then they got their friends instead of their brothers or sister. And then they ended up on their face because they didn't get a chance to practice with them. But this whole walking in step idea is pretty critical when it comes to walking with God. We watch what steps he's taking. We watch what way he's moving. How do we do that? Through reading the word, through understanding what his spirit is saying to us by prayer. Another example would be kind of this little bicycle, tandem bicycle, right? You know, your, your pedals kind of go at the same pace. If you try to pedal faster, or slower, it kind of messes you up. You're, sometimes your feet end up flying all over the place and, and you don't do so well. I think sometimes, another example of this would be, um, sometimes in our lives with the Holy Spirit, it, it's like, okay, the Holy Spirit has the front seat and he's steering us and he's driving us and we're letting him. And then all of a sudden we say, uh-uh, I want to steer, it's my turn. So you jump in the front seat instead. And then you sit there, you try to steer and, it's, and you end up in the wrong place. And I remember one time when my dad had us on this, um, we rented some bicycles, and we went out, <coughs> on that tandem bike, we were down at the beach, it was so exciting, so much fun. We were out there riding the line, and I'm like trying to keep my feet going with that, and it was so much fun. And then all of a sudden he took us down this, this road that was kind of a dead end, and there was a little like pathway through this little berm that was there, and he, he decided, oh, we can just go over that little berm and just go, and, he shouldn't have done it. I had to <laughs> we both ended up flat on our, face, on our sides and it didn't feel so good. But sometimes we take the wrong path and we try to take us in, in the ways that we shouldn't go. But if we let the Holy Spirit guide us, then we're going to be walking in step with him. This kind of step is uh, the Greek word stoikeo. Stoikeo means to walk, to live. It's this idea of soldiers like marching in a row. Step by step, marching in a row, keeping to the beat, you know? You're moving together. It's keeping the right pace <clears throat> as we're walking together with the Holy Spirit. If you, if you see even one person marching out of sync in 
in a, in a marching band or a parade, or if you're, look, if you're watching a military uh, parade, you, you see them marching so perfectly. If you saw one guy walk into his own step, you would notice it right away, wouldn't you? It's, it's because it, it's identifiable when he goes off track. But the thing is, we as Christians should be moving together. Okay, this, this passage is, talking, is, is being spoken to the church together. We together should be walking in step with the Spirit. Just like members of a parade walking together in step with the Spirit in unity and in oneness. Moving in the way that He is guiding us and calling us to live. Just like a group of soldiers marching. So we saw that we could walk more like Enoch did in his walk with God through proximity, being close to him, through our pace and how we go step by step with him. And now perseverance, perseverance. That's the third thing. Perseverance, the stick to of the walk. Sometimes if you don't train yourself, you get tired in your walk. Think of going on a hike that you didn't get ready for. I know I went on a hike one time that was just very difficult. We ended up having to go super fast speed because we started too late in the day. And because of that, we were all exhausted. But I hadn't trained for that hike. And it hurt by the end. It hurt because I had not trained myself to persevere in the way that I needed to persevere when it got tough. If I had trained myself in advance, that hike would not have been so difficult. So here is perseverance. Genesis 5, 24 says, Enoch walked, we're going to flashback now to Enoch again. He walked, what does it say? Walked, how? Faithfully. Walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. This idea of walking alongside walking faithfully. Walking faithfully with God is this kind of perseverance. It's a stick to itiveness. And then it says this in Hebrews 11. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So as we are walking in faith, we need to earnestly seek him. Earnestly seek him. What's that mean? Exeteo in the Greek, since we're doing Greek, right? Exeteo is to seek out, to search for, to personally investigate, to beg or crave. It's this really deep desire to get to know him, to get to know God, to really look for him, to really seek him. And when we do this, we will find him. We will find him. He can be found. He's not hiding. He can be found. This is not a hide and seek game, but we are to earnestly seek after him. Why? For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. This kind of earnestly seeking him is going to please God. This kind of walk is going to please God. And without faith, it is Sometimes possible to please God. It's a little bit possible to please God without faith, right? Is that what it says? No, it says it is impossible to please God. How many of you really would like to please God? I think every single one of us here would probably raise their hands. I, you know, I'd like to please God. I don't want to make him mad. Yeah, I'd love to please God. And if you want to please God, well, here's how. Faith. This is a relational faith. This is a faith that moves because it's walking with him. It's impossible to please him because anyone who comes to him must first believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We need to seek him out. We need to believe that he exists. This is faith. This is faith and this is a faith that moves. The questions today are these. How's your relationship with God? How's it going? Maybe you don't have one yet. Maybe today's the first day you've ever heard about a relationship with God. A relationship to God. 
You see, God made it possible to have a relationship with him because man rebelled against God and said, I don't want anything to do with you. I'll do my own thing my own way. And we've been doing it ever since Adam in the garden. But then God said, you know what? You broke fellowship with me, but I'm going to make a way to bring that fellowship back. And it's through Jesus Christ who died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And I made a way so that you can have fellowship with me. And so now we can have fellowship with God. How is your relationship? Do you have one? What is your walk with God like? What's your walk like? You know, if you were being watched to see how your walk was with God, how identifiable would it, even, would it even be that you are walking with God? Just like the hunchback of Notre Dame or the, you know, Napoleon. How identifiable is your walk with God? Can people look at you and go, that person's walking with God? Or would they look at you and go, well, I don't know. They talk about being a Christian, but I don't see any evidence. How is your walk? What's it like? And then the next question that follows that very simply is, what will you do about it? What will you do about it? Are you, are you just going to, you know, business as usual, just maintain whatever you're doing already? Or maybe your walk's really great, and that's important to maintain that really great walk. But I would bet that most of us could do a little something to improve that walk with God. To improve upon that walk. That our walk looks more and more like God's walk. That our, our steps are more and more in His steps. That we're in tandem, linked to Him as we move forward. That we're not tripping and stumbling because we're messing up our pace. And that we're training ourselves to be perseverant in this walk. What are you going to do to improve on the walk you've ha you have with God? What are you going to do? There's a lot of things you could do. You could ignore it. You could maintain it. But let's do something about it. And get moving in your faith. This is a relational faith. This is a faith that moves. God wants us to move in, in pace with Him and step with Him. So that we're a reflection of his love for the world around us. And it's not a walk to be done together, uh, separately. Like we talked about, it's to be done together. In unity. Step by step. Find friends that will help you do this walk together with them. Dig into the word if, you, if, you're, if you're not already doing so. Get into the word of God. Read it. Find ways to go deeper in your walk with God and improve that walk. I'm going to pray and I'm also going to thank God for the food during this prayer as well and then we'll be dismissed. But let's just pray right now and ask God to help us do this. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that indwells us and makes it possible to walk in step with you. We are linked to you and we pray that we would not try to stray off the path. Give us strength, Lord. We need it. Help us to hold each other up in this walk so that we can continue to persevere to follow you with our whole hearts. Help us to do this well. We get one life to live. Help us to do it well from this day forward. And Father, we thank you for the food that we're going to share together here in a minute. We thank you for fellowship that we can join together talking to each other and Lord I pray that it would be a really special time of fellowship encouraging each other being open with each other sharing the real parts of our lives with each other in Jesus name I pray amen Good morning we are going to be speaking uh, from the word I'm going to be speaking from the word from Hebrews chapter 11 and if you haven't been with us I'm going to give you a quick update as to where we are in Hebrews chapter 11 Hebrews chapter 11 is known as the great hall of faith, uh, if you didn't know that before. And it takes you through a list of people who are renowned for their amazing faith. God accredited them with all kinds of acclamation for their wonderful faith. 
And um, as we're looking at this, we're calling this series Faith That Moves. And this is not a blind faith. It's not a type of blind faith at all. It's a tangible faith. In the first week, we looked at creation and how creation, the creation that is all around us, points to a creator.